uh, Charter School Institute for the sole purpose of applying for federal competitive grants, including ESEA, is an important provision to help students learn and achieve in a school that does not mean that the charter schools are LEAs for any other purpose other than those specifically designed. Without this change, Colorado students would be at a competitive disadvantage because many other states already allow charter schools to compete for all federal grants. Especially in these difficult budget times, I strongly encourage you to help maximize the ability of, charters, of Colorado schools to compete for federal funds by passing House Bill 1089 into law. So, uh, I, it's pretty straightforward. It's a basic uh, opportunity for charter schools to have a chance to apply for competitive grants under what we uh, know as No Child Left Behind. Uh, there was also a House amendment that said that if the charter schools apply for a grant, they will give uh, the authorizing district a copy of the grant and uh, whether or not they did receive the money and uh, kind of summarize how the grant money is used. I also have a uh, amendment that I will offer, and I've passed that out, and that's amendment number 11, which talks about the opportunity if a school district can collaborate with its authorizing district, that it shall seek to do so and try to collaborate in such a way that uh, they can uh, work together. If, however, they are unable to collaborate in the joint application of the grant, it gives the charter school the opportunity to apply for this uh, for these grants independently or in collaboration. And just quickly, uh, mainly for Senator Nicholson's uh, sake, last year I also carried a collaborative bill to allow charter schools to collaboratively seek uh, grants. And in that particular bill, what you find is you might find a, a charter schools have themes. Uh, I think uh, you'll maybe hear some of that today that are, but they're authorized in multiple districts. And so they might be three or schools authorized by three different districts, and so they want to come together as a group and try and do something in, that is not unique to one school in one district, but they want to collaborate across district lines. And so um, that's where you find a lot of collaboration that can happen, and that's why it's really important to allow uh, charter schools to apply as kind of a collaborative as opposed to one district saying no to them as they try to go forward in a new age. And I think uh, Congressman Polis had it right uh, in difficult times. This is another vehicle for us to allow charter schools in the state of Colorado to compete for grants. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about the bill. That's uh, pretty straightforward what it does. And uh, go from there. Any questions? Senator Budak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, ha I have a number of questions. Um, just uh, something I would point out, though, you say this has bipartisan support. I don't see a single Democrat's name on the bill, but maybe you have some Democrats in the Senate who told you they would support it. However, yes, um, Polis. well, but Jared Polis, I okay, I Jared Polis. but he's not a member of the legislature. But the committee report from the House and the vote in the House under him. I don't have the vote in front of me, but what I what I did it say was in is. the this committee has passed uh, it passed forty nine to sixteen in the uh, House. What what I was talking about last year, I think I Senator Hudak was one sixty one past the Senate thirty to five, and so uh, it had bipartisan support last year. And th by the way, this was in the bill as it passed out of the Senate last year. I think I said that, but. Uh, and this this provision was in the bill as it passed through the House last year. So it has had bipartisan support uh, last year and this year, and, and this year it was 49 to 16. Okay. So you day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So that was my comment. Um, my question is, you, you didn't really talk about something that I see. You mostly talked about why we needed the bill last year. And by the way, I was one of the five. As you know. <laughs> I knew um, that. So <laughs> you didn't have to remind me. <laughs> now, you and I have worked very well together and collaborated on a number of things. This wasn't a good idea. But this was not one of them. <laughs> um, 
because I, I still do not, well, I, I don't think the Charter School Institute should be acting as an agent for a district school. And I don't think um, a school should be applying for a grant that its district doesn't want them to get. But that's last year's argument. This year's bill, as I see it, other than um, you know the uh, reporting to the district about whether they did or didn't get the grant, the only other thing that I see this bill doing and, and removing ESEA as a possibility is on line 8 and also on line 21, you're adding or state. So your discussion of the bill had to do with federal grants, but it seems to me what this bill is really doing is allowing this continuation of something that I object to, to, to allow them to then access state grants. And what state grants might those be? Senator uh, King? Well, it, we're adding the word or state statute or program to that particular uh, place in the uh, bill. So uh, there are state grants that we have in Colorado. A good example was the council program. Uh, that was an opportunity for a high school specifically in Colorado to apply for our, my school college friends or the colleges applied for that grant and got that grant. Uh, but we were part of the institute, and so the institute was very agreeable to do that. But if a charter school that is authorized by a school district did not want their charter schools to apply for the council program, they would have been uh, prohibited uh, from doing it. So this clears this up and says competitive grants should have an opportunity, whether it's authorized by a federal statute or a state statute, to be able to have it in the council program is a great example of uh, what applies in that. So, uh, and uh, the, the, the rest of it is just strictly the no child with behind type of competitive grants. So. Senator Nicholson. So maybe it still could be a king who did that, that is Senator <laughs> King for you people listening, not <laughs> Senator Nicholson. Senator <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Senator Nicholson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator King, why wouldn't Senator King. Well, uh, there there might be a couple of reasons. One is that they might feel that uh, resources are limited, and if they have more competition for a specific grant, that uh, it might diminish the opportunity for the school district to get the grant as opposed to the charge to get the grant. Um, the the reality, though, on most federal grants is they're competed on on a national level and. There might be something uniquely going on with a charter school, it's a different educational program that the school district has, that would, uh, the district might feel, might give them a competitive advantage over the uh, school district. So uh, I think there's also a little bit of what Senator Hudak talked about, that uh, school districts are not an LEA. And since they're not an LEA, no charter schools are not. Charter schools are not an LEA. School districts. I am sorry. Charter schools are not an LEA. <coughs> and since charter schools are not an LEA, uh, there should be uh, some degree of collaboration or control by the school district, as opposed to letting them do their own education program. But I, I think you're going to hear some testimony today that uniquely talks about the opportunities that charter schools present for their students that are very unique. And I don't know if anybody has signed up in opposition to the bill, but uh, if there is, uh, they'll probably tell you why they think charter schools should go through school districts to be authorized. Any additional questions for the sponsor? Okay, we will proceed through the list. I have three people signed up, all four. Nobody in opposition? Not yet. Right. <laughs> now, I think that depends upon the length of the testimony. <laughs> so, uh, I would uh, discourage us from uh, 
plowing old ground. So, Benny, you first. Thank you. State your name, who you represent, and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Vinny Badalato. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs for the Colorado League of Charter Schools. And um, I had a little presentation prepared, but Senator King, in a good way, stole a lot of my thunder. So I'm going to be somewhat brief, I guess, in, in part of my presentation. We appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and I did um, have several uh, pieces of information that Jennifer just passed out to the group that I'm going to address. First, um, Senator King provided the background of this bill, so I'll, I'll skip that part. But in regard to um, why this is important now, and especially in regard to the reauthorization of the SEA, and, or no tell it behind, or however you want to term it these days. Um, first, in your packet, there's a little map. And that map comes from a report put forward by the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, which is the uh, oversight agency for the uh, Federal Congress. And they were requested to do a report on um, charter school grant making and actually re released this um, report back in December of 2010. And basically the report was, was centered at um, the Department of Education and encouraging the Department of Education federally to do a better job of making sure that charter schools are eligible for more federal grants. But this map is informative for this um, discussion because if you look at it, the, there is different color-coded states and the yellow and violet color-coded states are all states that are either their own LEAs or most of the uh, schools, uh, charter schools, are their own LEAs um, or, or part of a larger LEA. So basically what that means is that all the charter schools in the yellow and purple states are able to currently apply for any federal grant um, on their own without any sort of permission from an authorizer. And that's about 20 or so states, and very large states, including California, Texas, who each have, California has about 700 charter schools, Texas has about 500 plus charter schools, um, who are all able currently to compete for those federal opportunities. Um, the next page is the highlight um, page of that report, and I just highlighted two sections um, for the committee to take a look at, and I'll, I'll read those briefly. Um, the highlighted parts are, for example, 8% of charter schools, and this is nationally, designated as their own local education agency applied for grants compared to 2% of schools that were part of a larger school district or LEA. Based on the responses to our survey, some of the schools that are part of a larger school district believe they needed an LEA designation to be eligible for federal discretionary grants and did not apply because of their charter school status. And then further down it says, on the other hand, charter schools that are part of a larger LEA were not eligible to apply for grants that did not designate a public school or a nonprofit organization as an eligible applicant may not have applied for that reason. So there's already um, a restriction based with the federal government's identifying that says that in many states, charter schools aren't eligible and aren't applying even though in other places that they are. And Colorado currently is one of those states, at least in terms of ESEA grants. Um, and then also included in your packet um, are one, one thing that uh, Senator King spoke about, which is the letter from uh, Congressman Polis um, strongly supporting this, this provision as he's working hard to make sure that competitive grants are a part of the reauthorized ESEA and he wants to make sure that Colorado as a whole, not just Colorado Charter Schools, but all Colorado has a competitive um, uh, is in a good competitive space with the rest of the nation to compete for those grants. And um, interestingly enough, yesterday um, which was great timing for this committee, a group of um, 11 federal senators, uh, 10 Democrats and one independent, issued a um, value, a, a principle statement called the Call for Urgency, a statement of principles to fix the elementary and secondary education act. And one of the top signers happens to be Colorado Senator, um, one of Colorado Senator, Senator Bennett. And I'm just going to read one brief little piece of that. And you have in your packet the um, press release from Senator Bennett's office. But um, as part of their, their statement, they say, as competitive grant programs designed to scale up innovative initiatives with demonstrated success, the IE program, for those who don't know, that's Investing in Innovation, which is one of the two competitive grant programs that were put forward with the stimulus plan that was raised to the top in the I3 um, program. The I3 program received an unprecedented number of applicants. 
We believe this is evidence that state, district states and their entrepreneurial partners are ready now more than ever to break the mold of the status quo and develop new solutions to meet critical needs. And then further on, they say, fixing ESEA provides us an opportunity to do that by continuing the race to the top and investing in innovation fund and supporting high quality charter and autonomous public schools. And again, that was a statement signed and issued by um, Senator Bennett amongst others. Um, so with that also, you know, there's lots of talk at the federal level. So you've seen Senator Polis, uh, Congressman Polis's letter, you've seen um, or I mentioned uh, Senator Bennett's letter. There's also the Blueprint for Reform, which was released back in March of last year, which is the administration, the Obama administration's goals for reauthorizing ESEA. And as part of that, they also talk about an extensive number of competitive grant opportunities. So what we're, we're trying to do with this bill is basically put Colorado ahead of the federal government and make sure that if there are, or when I should say, there are all these competitive opportunities within ESEA when that's reauthorized potentially this year, but who knows with the way it's been going, but potentially this year, that Colorado charter schools are well positioned and Colorado as a state is well positioned to have as many competitive actors in the game as possible to be able to compete against California, Texas, states with many districts, many charter schools who will all be vying for the same federal funds. So what we're trying to do here is make sure that we give uh, Colorado charter schools and Colorado as a whole the allowance and state law to go after these grants. Um, and, you know, there's been some talk about um, this causing some divisions within districts and charter schools and whatnot, and I just want to speak quickly to that and, and say that as, as the League of Charter Schools, we would never advise an individual school to go after a federal grant on their own unless they're well positioned to go after on their own, unless they have a large staff who can manage the grant application process, the reporting process, and everything along the line. What we're envisioning here, and what um, some of our testifiers will speak to, as well as many other schools out there, what we're envisioning here is that schools across districts will come together as groups and compete as a group to go after these grants to enhance their opportunities and perhaps go in with districts. I mean, there's been, and go in with district schools in the House Education Committee, and I didn't ask them to come here today to respect everyone's time, but in the House Education Committee, we had a um, representative from a school, a charter school, that was managing a federal grant um, that was given, that was outside of, of the ESEA provisions, that they partnered with both charter schools and traditional district schools to achieve this grant through the, um, I believe it was through EPA. So this is something that we don't envision charter schools instantly on their own going up and competing against their districts. That's not what this will do. What this will hopefully do is foster collaboration among schools and give charter schools the, at least the ability to make the decision on their own and whether, whether to compete on their own merits for these competitive opportunities. Uh, so with that, I would welcome any questions from any questions for Mr. Badalato? You're thorough. Thank you. Thank you. Brief. We love it. By Dominic Ivariche. I'm also going to bring up uh, David Ryan. We'll do a little bit okay. more. Okay. David Ryan and Dominic. Is it De Felice? De Felice. De Felice. Of happiness. Of mm -hmm. happiness. Literal translation. Great. What a wonderful name. Uh, Dominic DiFelice, I'm the superintendent of New America Schools, and uh, I have with us also David Ryan, who's uh, development director with uh, New America Schools. And what we'd like to do is briefly describe the charter schools that we represent, and then I'm going to turn it over to David, who's going to give you some real examples why we believe it's important for this bill to move forward. Um, New America Schools was founded in 2004 by Congressman Polis, and uh, the schools meet the needs of new immigrants and English language learners. Currently, we have three schools in Colorado. They're, they are in three different districts, Aurora, Lakewood, and the, the Lakewood with the Jefferson County, and we have a school with the Mapleton District. We also have a school in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I think that that's important where I'll show you a little bit of differences between the two states. We serve uh, close to 1,500 of the high-risk learners in, in Colorado. All four of our schools are alternative education campuses, which for Colorado, that means that 95% plus 
students in each of our schools is deemed to be high risk. And there's 11 criteria for a student to be in that particular category, including interrupted education, pregnancy, trouble with the law, et cetera. So we're dealing with potentially 1,500 of the most at-risk kids in the city. Uh, just to give you some demographics, 68% of our kids are over 18 years of age. 23% of them are either young parents or pregnant moms. 63% of our kids are English language learners. And uh, for ethnicity purposes, 89% are Hispanic. When we talk about education, 90% of the kids that come to our school are either reading uh, or performing in mathematics below grade level. And in fact, 61% of the students are working below grade six when it comes to mathematics and language use. And when you look at a proxy for poverty, 85% of our kids are on free and reduced lunch. It's an extremely needy population, and we need as many resources as possible. And as you all know, the state has cut back probably up to 10% this year for school funding. We've had hits of close to 20% over the last three or four years. And it's a population that is in desperate need of resources. And uh, if I could piggyback on the previous uh, motion that was before you in terms of truancy, the kids that come to us have not been regular attendance. Our metric for attendance in our schools is about 75%. If we can get to 75%, we think we're doing a great job. And But we need resources. Uh, this year we were successful in, in winning, and David will talk to this, a dropout grant for about $100,000 a year for the next five years. One of the things that it's allowed us to do is we'll, we'll be able to hire an attendance counselor to deal with some of the truancy issues that we have additional resources. We are a, a unique kind of configuration. I think if you, if you did a poll across the nation, you might find a dozen or so schools that look like us in terms of meeting the needs of these kinds of kids and the kinds of kids that we're trying to focus in on. We can compete for a lot of these grants, and I think it's important. So first of all, thank you for last year's bill, 161. Uh, however, I think that the bill's original intent now needs to go forward, and I the ability for charter schools to apply for state and competitive grants. There's over $700 million on the table for reauthorization of competitive grants federally, and we want to be part of that game. Now, as a small school in, in, in these three large districts, oftentimes we have no access to the grants, and oftentimes if they do give us a bit of the grant that they receive, it's a very, very small portion of it, and far less than we might have gotten if we had uh, applied independently. In contrast, you look at our Albuquerque school in New Mexico, it's its own LEA. It's able to apply independently, and it's won several state grants and other competitive grants. And I think it would be ironic, in fact tragic, if our kids in Colorado would not be able to apply for the same kind of kit, same kind of grants that some of the other states are applying for. Uh, David's going to give you some examples of, of some of the issues that are on the table, and hopefully that will clarify it, and then we'll turn it over for questions. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to run through a few Introduce minutes. yourself for the tape and the listening audience. It's uh, recorded for posterity. My name is David Ryan. I'm the Director of Development for the New America School. I'm just going to give you a few examples of very concrete grant opportunities over the past year alone that the New America School's student population would have greatly benefited from had we been able to secure those funds and for which we were unable to compete for those grants. I thought a good starting point would be the school, um, school um, counselor core program that was mentioned earlier. Um, here's a program that our students would desperately need as um, Dominic mentioned, 95% of our students are high risk. A large percent of those are our parents. Um, about 10% have either experienced violence or neglect within the family. 20% have drug or alcohol um, related problems. This is a population in desperate need of counseling and mental health services. Last year, we were forced due to budget concerns um, we lost one of our, our one mental health counselor. 
this year, um, one of our schools is moving to a new facility and will be doubling its student population. And we have one counselor presently um, working at that school. Um, Dominic mentioned the um, Colorado Graduation Pathways Project that we're participating in, which will allow us to hire an attendance counselor, one attendance counselor working just with two of our schools, and we wouldn't have an attendance counselor at the third school. Well, um, just this week, the, um, the state issued a call for letters of inquiry for two districts looking um, to apply for um, the, uh, the school counselor um, core program, provided it get funding. It's a perfect situation as to why um, our school is precluded from this. One of our districts received that funding last year. So when we called them and asked them to be part of that, um, part of their district application, we were told that they're already in the midst of, of their program, so they weren't going to reapply. Mm -hmm. We would not be eligible. Um, another one of our districts has told us that their process is a very informal process where um, their, their grant workers, and, and actually let me be specific because I don't want to be throwing out just one of our districts. The Aurora School District is in the midst of the of, of a current grant, and Jefferson County District um, has told us that their process is rather informal, where their grants officers get together and discuss which schools do they think would be best for various grants. And as such, um, since we do not have as close of a tie, perhaps, as some of the other schools, we might not be considered for this. Um, so it's a great op opportunity, one which we're not going to be able to participate in. Give you a second example of how um, Bill 161 was a great benefit to us, and hopefully this can point to how it could be beneficial to expand what 161 did. Last year, um, the federal government issued a grant opportunity called Improving Literacy Through School Libraries. This grant provides about an average of $400,000 to schools, school, to schools within school districts to improve their library services for the purposes of bringing up reading scores. As Dominic mentioned, 60% of our students read below grade six level and 90% read below grade level. <coughs> Something would be tremendously beneficial. Last year we were interested in it. Um, we were not able to apply for this grant for two of our three districts, or two of our three schools, because the federal government set a criteria of you have to be a high risk district in order to apply. Well, only the Aurora School District of our three districts met that criteria, yet all three of our schools met that criteria. And Aurora did apply, but they had a specific school that they had in mind that was going to apply that they were going to apply for, and they based their decision on a first come, first serve basis. That school approached the Aurora School District well before any of the other schools. Um, and that's how they made their decision. This year, we are eligible to apply, and we're working with the Charter School District to not only apply for our three schools, but we've extended an invitation to every school that meets three simple criteria. An alternative education campus, 95% or more at risk, a charter school and within the front range for logistics so we could get to them. That's 14 schools and it's not 14 districts that we would have to coordinate with but it's um, many districts. There's Boulder schools, Colorado Springs schools and Denver schools and we're inviting them all to participate in this program apply for a grant that may bring $400,000 into the state and to help our students. Um, so another couple of quick examples of grants that we didn't apply for last year. There was a grant to reduce alcohol abuse. 20% of our students have either alcohol or drug related problems. It's a grant that would give awards ranging from $250,000 to $450,000. We were not eligible to apply. So another grant um, to integrate schools and mental health systems. Another range of $200,000 to $400,000 um, that the awards were. And I mentioned all of the adult problems that our students are experiencing, their, the fact that their parents, the fact that many of them are independent, um, the fact that one of our schools lost its mental health worker, um, 
we were actively working, as a matter of fact, with um, Aurora Mental Health at that time to try to integrate our services independent of this grant. And we would have applied for that had we been eligible, but we weren't able to. And I have a few other examples if other people are interested, but I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Any questions for Mr. Ryan or Mr. DiPolice? Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not a question, but just a comment and a thank you. I um, was a principal in Naples for six years, so I was a neighbor of yours. And um, we had a number of students who have come through our school and gone to yours, kids that were very at risk and needed more support in a different structure. Um, and I just always found you all to be great neighbors. I know that our superintendent in Naples can find you to be such. And that, um, really do great work with kids that need the most help. So I think a lot of people, when they thought about what the charter movement was meant to do, I think they envisioned schools like yours that would find ways to serve kids who aren't being served well. So I just want to thank you for what I think is a really pure and well thought issue. Yeah, and I'd like to echo what, what Senator... Uh, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. But I wanted to echo what Senator Johnston said, that back in the, in the days, of course, the charter school legislation was passed the year before I came to the, the House Representatives back in... What, 985 or whatever. Uh, what it was passed, but before I came. Uh, and this was one of the, the visions of the charter school movement to address the population, much as you do in the New America schools. And uh, familiar with a, a school in, in my own district, which costs us much more than the PPR we get in order to deal with this kind of a population. And we all know that this kind of investment in those kinds of students may help us tremendously as a greater society in, in avoiding costs later on. And so any investment that we can make in the New America School and like schools to deal with these really vulnerable populations, I think benefits us all down the road. And so I appreciate what you're doing in the New America School. Just to put in, uh, yes, if I may, just to put a number on that. Uh, we were at a conference last week and heard a speaker who's done considerable research on the cost of students not graduating. He puts that number at $300,000 per student in terms of mental, health, prison, you name the kinds of overall costs. And last year we graduated 130 students that probably would not have graduated in a typical traditional school. For every 100 students, the country saves $30 million. So we want as many resources as possible to get our most at-risk kids graduated. Compelling. What charter Senator. schools were supposed to be in the original version passed in 1993. And that, that uh, factor about serving at risk students was removed from the law in the late 90s. But um, I'm, I'm a little concerned about your characterization of the Jefferson County School District as having a casual conversation about who gets what grant. And um, I, do, you, do you have any idea which schools actually did get I, the grants that you competed for? I, uh, I, or I, Senator Hudak, I don't think that we need to investigate okay, uh, well, in this bill hearing with okay. specific schools for, in your school district. Okay. Sorry. All right, I will, I will check with you later because... <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, your testimony was that... Um, you were unable to access certain grants and other schools received them. Uh, Mr. Wright. Um, I, I, I respectfully want to change a word. I didn't talk in terms of casual. I talked about informal, as in there was not a formal procedure through which individual schools can um, let the Jefferson County uh, Grants Department um, that, that they would have to follow, that each school would follow the same formal procedure and be put on, say, a docket when any grant opportunity um, arises, then each of those schools would be considered um, in the same fashion. I met with um, the grants folks at Jefferson County last year and was told that the word informal, using the word informal, that the process was that when grant opportunities arise, um, their grants department gets together and meets and discusses amongst themselves which um, schools they feel would present the best opportunity for 
um, that specific grant. And given the fact that the New America School might not have as um, intimate relationship um, with various grant officers as others, it, it's nothing um, intentional or even, um, you know, there's, there's nothing malicious involved, but rather we might not enter the conversation as the committee is, as, as the workers are getting together to discuss how to approach that grant. So this, I, I, I'm curious how you think this grant might, I mean this bill might fix that situation because are you saying that you would have a more intimate and connected relationship with the Charter School Institute and that would give you a better opportunity? Mr. Wright? Um, I, I'm, I'm not talking in terms of whether um, this bill would fix the situation we just described. Mm -hmm. This bill addresses an entirely different situation of it allows us the opportunity to pursue grants on our own um, working through the Charter School Institute so that um, if there is an opportunity available we can compete on an equal footing. It may not be equal but it may be because of the persuasive argument and, and, and the criteria of the granting agencies. Am I correct? Uh, Mr. De Felice? What it does is it allows us to present our own case, uh, given our own unique set of circumstances, and, and makes us be able to present a compelling argument why our particular school might need those particular resources. And uh, I think in a very formal way, I think what David is saying is the formality is not there with respect to a grant structure, must do this, must identify that, and, et cetera. That, that happens there as opposed to simply putting something out like an RFP. Tell me what you can do. Here we're going to do a grant uh, application. We'll have a very compelling reason why that particular grant is congruent to our particular needs and why it would best serve the needs of our students. Any additional questions for either of the two witnesses? Seeing none, thank you both for your insights and your uh, experiences. Is there anybody else in the room who would like to testify on House Bill 1089? Going once, twice, testimony is concluded. <laughs> Senator King. Uh, thank you. I think we've had a great hearing. Uh, I think you understand the concept behind the bill. Uh, I'm happy to move uh, 1089. Uh, <laughs> Also, Amendment 11, and maybe we need to get back to the committee before we yes. vote. <laughs> the Senate Education will take a brief recess to retrieve some of the committee. The Senate Education will come back to order uh, from recess. Senator King has moved. Yes, I was. Uh, I could tell. 1089 and has moved Amendment 11. Amendment 11. And Senator King, Amendment 11 does what? Amendment 11 uh, tries to see if there's a way for school districts and charter schools to collaborate in the process of seeking these competitive grants and uh, submit the application jointly. If that's not possible, uh, based upon the fact like the New America schools that have multiple districts and multiple locations throughout the metro area, then they have an opportunity to apply for their grants independently and uh, they can collaborate with other charter schools to do that. So that's basically what Amendment 11 is. And in many conversations, I have said that it's the best that we, we ought to be aiming for districts and the charter schools to cooperate, collaborate, communicate, whatever all it takes in order to, to move this forward. And so this amendment then does um, encourage them to do that. Maybe I need to go beyond that. And last year I was persuaded, as I'm persuaded this year, that as long as there are other states in which the charter schools as LEAs are going to compete with these national grants, uh, it seems as though if we are being mean-spirited in Colorado and preventing that from getting resources in order to help the students in Colorado. And I do appreciate that there are sometimes our fears sometimes maybe not legitimate fears on the part of school districts that they're going to get the huge grant and the school district isn't going to get anything. And you know, who, who can say that your fears are really unfounded in that whole process?
process. And one of the, the fixes I had uh, thought about was to try to find some sort of uh, proration of applying for the grant. But this is an utterly, seemingly an impossible way to go in dealing with it. And uh, as long as other states allow charter schools to be LEAs applying for these grants, I, I see that uh, it's legitimate for Colorado moves forward. And, and I think that this is a uh, statement of wishes uh, in this amendment. And uh, I can support this moving forward and hoping to get more resources to help students in Colorado. And I certainly hope that the districts do not feel as though they are at an unfair advantage in applying. And in conversations I've had with the charter school people, districts, most districts have, <coughs> at least with which I'm familiar, have the resources in order to be able to write the grants for applications that are far exceed the ability many times of charter schools and even combinations of charter schools. And so there is an advantage there on the part of the school district, certainly the school district with which I'm most familiar in dealing with it. And so I certainly support the amendment Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also support the amendment, but I have a question. How would we determine if they are unable to collaborate? Senator King? Well, they will uh, be at an impasse and they will not allow the charter school uh, to participate with the school district in a collaborative form. So uh, there will be an informal conversation. It's, I'm not trying to make this a formal confrontational issue. What I'm trying to do is make it a collaborative, uh, cooperative issue. And so uh, uh, that probably could be an informal conversation that they have between the charter school and the district. Uh, so uh, I'm not trying to qualify that in the amendment. I'm just asking them to collaborate as much as possible to uh, work together. And if that's not possible, go ahead and submit it on. Senator Hudak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But it sounded like your answer was if the school district doesn't agree to include the charter school in its application or uh, give the charter school the permission, as it were, to seek it. And so um, if they didn't want the charter school to have it in the first place, then I, I don't see how how this how this helps. Well, what we're saying, is basi King. Well, what we're basically saying is something almost like a legislative declaration with this amendment. Try to collaborate. Try to work together. Try to see if there's a way that the charter school and the school district can work together. If that doesn't appear to be possible, either uh, from the school district level or from the charter school level. Uh, if that doesn't seem to be possible, the charter school still has the flexibility to do it. There's another variable there, too, that I, I did not perceive at first, that many charter schools in collaborating with other charter schools in other districts with other chartering entities uh, then have the, the, the task of getting cooperation from each one of those areas. And, and it may be logistics, it may be intransigence, it may be many sorts of things. And so. Uh, in, in initially looking at the bill, I was thinking of my own experience. One school district, one charter school district, chartered by that school district, maybe one there are others. But now I recognize that there are multiple charter schools that band together having similar kinds of programs that may be chartered by Charter School Institute, may be chartered by various school districts. And so it may be difficult for those to get permission or at least cooperation from each one of the school boards are chartering the agents in order to proceed with that. Uh, and it looks like it. So when it says it's, <coughs> if it's possible, that it may be that just one of the school districts lets it fall off the page and doesn't even answer, maybe the, the lack of possibility. Am I correct in making right. these kinds of things? Yeah, that, that's a good example. That's correct. And I think uh, uh, what we're trying to maximize in uh, difficult financial times is collaboration between uh, districts and charter schools and then also multiple charter schools in multiple districts. I'm sorry, Hudak, you had another question. Go ahead. No. Okay, all right. Uh, Senator Eaton? Thanks. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator King, I, I'm just struggling a little bit with the awkward language, it seems to me, in here. And I, I, I just threw two words in, and frankly, I don't know if it helps, but on line uh, seven, 
line six and seven, if the charter school and the school district are able to agree to collaborate. Does that help at all? Uh, yeah, if you think that does, that's uh, it, it, it's, oh. I, I think it, I, I think we're, we're trying to yeah. collaborate and work together, and if, if that's, I, I just, that shows intent. Yeah, I, if you're unable to agree to collaborate, then the school may apply for the grant. I don't know, I just throw it in as a, that's fine. I, I would consider that a friendly amendment if okay. you want to offer yeah. that. So. It helps me anyway. Okay. Is there any objection to Senator Heath's conceptual amendment, even though the words are there, of uh, inserting agree to. Uh, are unable to agree to. Are unable to agree to uh, collaborate. Any objection to that? Seeing none. It's passed. Is there any, are there any additional comments or questions in dealing with Amendment 11? Is there any objection to Amendment 11? Seeing none. Amendment Yep, you have an objection? Yeah. Okay, Senator Renfro? Thank you. Objects. Staff call the roll. Senator Heath? Aye. Senator Johnston? Aye. Senator King? Aye. Senator Nicholson? Excused. Senator Renfro? No. Senator Spence? No. Senator Hudak? Aye. Mr. Chair? Aye. Passes by to two. And Senator Renfro just kept it off the consent calendar. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Well, we really don't well, like this amendment. That doesn't mean I'm not going to vote for the bill. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah, but you told us the other day you can't vote for something for the consent calendar if it's amended. But anyway, I'm <laughs> a bit facetious. <laughs> no. So this you guys your, kept it off then because I voted this for this, <laughs> this is your round. Uh, okay. Uh, there is another amendment. Amendment 8. I move Amendment 8. Which is being distributed to you. Okay, and what does Amendment 8 uh, say, Senator Dubeck? Amendment 8, in lines 5 through 12, I think the key word is the very last word on line 12, unless. I wanted to point that out to you before you read the beginning of the paragraph. Notwithstanding anything that has been said before, the Charter School Institute won't act as the local education agency and fiscal agent, yada, 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 unless, number one, in the case of a district charter school, the percentage of the population that are at-risk pupils equals or exceeds the percentage of the authorizing district, or number two, and they case of an institute charter school, the percentage of the at-risk population in the charter school equals or exceeds the percentage of at-risk students in the charter school's accounting district, which is the school district in which it is located. Okay, okay any, uh, Senator King? Uh, I would ask for a no vote on this. Uh, let me give you multiple reasons why. Uh, and I'll, I'll start with a practical reason the Colorado Springs Early College is. Colorado Springs Early College is a high school and a charter school. It does not have a K-8 underneath it. So if, if you know how at risk is determined in the school finance formula, it's determined upon kids who fill out the free and reduced lunch form who only qualify for free lunch. That's the proxy. That's not fully true there's English language learners also well the basic proxy for free uh, for at-risk students I the 90% of the formula would, would be for kids qualifying for for free and reduced lunch what happens at our school is because district 11 which we are located in and that's how we are compared to it doesn't even count high school kids for pre and reduced lunch because what the state allows them to do is take the average of the K-8 at risk mm -hmm. and apply it over the universe of K-12. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that universe at uh, District 11 is roughly 40%. I have at Carver Spring Grove College is 170 kids who don't even show up on campus at, at all. Even if we were qualified for free or reduced lunch, they would have to return from Pikes Peak Community College, drive 10, 15 miles, get a free lunch, 
and go back to their school because at Pikes Peak because they are taking full load off campus. So there is absolutely zero incentive for those kids, and we have tried to incentivize them, uh, our kids as much as possible. The, the proxy, frankly, does not work well. And I'll tell you another school that doesn't work well for us, the New American Schools. Uh, I heard a statistic uh, just about their same process at their school. Uh, they were getting roughly 40% of their kids considered to be at risk. They went and really pushed hard to try and get it done so that they could have a more accurate representation and went from 40 to 90% uh, in, in a representation of at-risk kids. So what, what I don't like, and in, in fact it, it's something that I, I think we need to work on in the School Finance Act, whoever carries that in the Senate this year, I would like to work with saying is there a better proxy except free lunch for how we define the, the, the kids <laughs> in the state of Colorado because it, it, it doesn't give a good fundamental definition. Uh, we, we have so many other kids that are at risk that are not just free lunch kids. So in this particular case, what is going to happen if we pass this amendment? This is going to, uh, this really has nothing to say. Why would we want to take away from New American Schools the opportunity to apply for a grant, or why would we want to take away from Carver Springs or the colleges the opportunity to apply for the Council Corps grant or any other competitive grant that maybe the uh, early colleges across the state of Colorado could uh, collaborate together and come up with a, uh, a grant for early colleges. The, the other fundamental problem with this is we have collaborations of across district of charter schools. And the New American Schools is a perfect example. So how are you going to determine the at-risk number for the district as opposed to the at-risk number for the charter schools? Is it going to be based individually, each district and each charter school? And if one has less or more, it disqualifies the collaboration from happening. Uh, let's, allow, let's allow the charter schools on their own behalf to do the best job for the kids that are in their school district and not create an artificial barrier, which this does create. Is, it's an artificial barrier, and it's, it's frankly not a good proxy for high schools, especially the two that we I've mentioned to you alone don't have the underpinnings of the KA, and so their at-risk numbers are going to be different. So uh, just for a lot of reasons, I, I think this is a bad amendment. I know, so Senator Hudak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, actually, I was specifically trying to help schools like yours and New America School. And if, if you're saying that the, <coughs> that, that the calculation for at risk um, doesn't help those schools, then they would, not, uh, they would also not be receiving the extra at risk money that the district um, gets to give to at-risk students and I've never I've never been told that that was an issue so um, I mean when people talk about the new America school they always talk about the percentage of at-risk students that are in the school and you know I do I do believe that free and reduced lunch is a good way of counting because it's poverty and poverty creates the highest at-risk level um, for students um, I agree with you that counting it in a high school is, is difficult, but um, that's why districts use the, um, the percentage in elementary school and sometimes middle school and, and kind of extrapolate that up to the high school. So are you telling me that these charters that serve highly at-risk students are not getting credit for having those at-risk students in the other funding either? Uh, Senator King. That, that's exactly what is happening. I'll give you a perfect example of what happened to February's uh, payment uh, of Carver Springs Early Colleges and 17 of the 19 schools uh, that are authorized through the Institute because uh, only about 25 to 30 percent of all charter schools in the state offer a free and reduced lunch program. We find it very difficult for the, the uh, uh, parents that have any incentive to fill out the form, the free lunch and free and reduced lunch form. So 
what happened uh, in February, Carver Springs Early Colleges took a hit of $58,000 on its PPR monthly draw because we have less at-risk students or free lunch students at our school, supposedly. Supposedly. That's not absolutely true. I'll just tell you, it's not true as compared to the District K-8 population of District 11. And so uh, the Institute Charter Schools, because of this at-risk formula, took an over a $300,000 hit collectively. And uh, in many cases, they have equal to or greater than populations. But the proxy, the free lunch proxy, just does not work for charter schools. If all charter schools had the kitchens, and had the ability to offer the free and reduced lunch programs and uh, were fully participating in it, I, I think you would see a totally different result. But what happens, and I'll just, because I, when I took a $58,000 hit in February on my PPR at our school, I did a lot of questions and went over and talked to Bodie and uh, the CSI. And District 11 has five institute charter schools in it, and what happens with the total at-risk population, the at-risk population of District 11 is a certain number. Each of the five institute schools have a different at-risk number, which is somewhat lower. Some, one, there's one, I think, or two that are higher, but they're lower mainly because they don't offer lunch programs. And so when District 11 gets its overall number, it gets a lower number. So the 58,000 does not come back to CDD. The 58,000 goes to District 11. And that's because we supposedly lowered the rate of how many at-risk students were in District 11, and we lowered their overall at-risk percentage. So I, I don't think it's a great proxy system. Uh, I think there would be a better way to identify kids. I don't know exactly what we would use, but uh, this proxy does not work uh, for uh, institute charter schools in particular, and it definitely is not a fair representation of how many qualified free lunch kids are in charter schools across the state.